nose um, to see if it was just relaxing. And I've discovered that it is. Um, so going forward on this channel, it's going to be videos, history videos, facts, trivia, um, that kind of thing. So if it's something you enjoy, I Illustrations um, of old photographs from Sterling. 
So it says from 1874, horse drawn, horse, horse drawn trams ran between Bridge of Allen and Stirling, later carrying on to St. Ninian's. Steam driven lorries disappeared from the streets many years ago. The iron rimmed wheels must have made travelling in them very uncomfortable. So that's the they must have made an absolute mess of the cobbled paths as well. This here is Stirling's town wall built in 1547 to protect the town from English troops. That's also just down from the uh, Stirling Castle. So this is chapter one. Meet your ancestors. On day one in the year 1819, which is about 180 years ago, a workman was digging in a field near Air 3 Castle. He was making a trench in which to lay drain pipes. As he worked, his spade hit something unusual in the soil, a bone. But this was no ordinary animal bone, and he cleared the earth away. He found the entire skeleton of a large whale about 20 metres long. Soon experts came to look at it. As they examined the creature, they found the remains of flint daggers and bone tools wedged among the bones. This whale probably washed up or stranded on the shore about 6,000 years ago and had eaten, sorry, had been eaten by Stone Age people, our ancestors, the very first people to visit the Stirling area. At that time, the land looked very different from today. Forests grew on the hills and down on the flat land besides the River Forth. This is the River Forth here. It's the river. Where the houses of Brayhead, Raplock, Riverside, Causeway Head, Cambus Kenneth, Cornton and Bridge of Allen are today. There used to be a wide expanse of shallow seas and tidal marshlands. Perhaps that's how the whale got there. Imagine a group of Stone Age people, the very first ever to see the Oakle Hills or the silvery waters of the River Forth, venturing cautiously into this uninhabited landscape. They came along the shores of the river from the direction of Falkirk. Here at Stirling was an area with plenty of food for was, plenty of food for the hunters to find. There were animals and berries in the forests, fish and shellfish in the river, and plenty of wildlife in the marshes. The first Stone Age explorers did not stay permanently in the Forth Valley. When the local food supply was eaten, they moved on, looking to camp and hunt in other places. But eventually, about 5,000 years ago, people did begin to settle here. Some of their possessions, such as broken pottery, bowls and flint tools, have been found all over the Stirling area. One man in the Raplock dug up a perfect stone axe head in his back garden. It was 4,000 years old. On the slopes of Demayat, you can still see the outline of fields where prehistoric settlers kept cattle and grew barley and wheat. About 4,000 years ago, the first metal workers began to settle in the area. They made bronze, which is a mixture of copper and tin. A few of their bronze possessions, such as axes 
and arrowheads have been found in the ground around Stirling. For example, a battle axe was found at St Ninian's. Who did it belong to and how did it get there? We'll never know. The Bronze Age people were mostly farmers. One of their farmhouses was found near Plain. It was circular in shape, about seven metres across, and the roof, roof used to be held up by wooden posts. You can still see a ditch which surrounded the houses for protection. Another farm lies under the house. Sorry. Another farm lies under the present police headquarters at Randolph Field. It had a farmhouse and a separate building for the animals. What makes this example interesting is that it was first discovered by a dowser who detected the buildings under the ground just by using sticks to point where they were. The local Bronze Age people were also very interested in burials. When someone important died, they placed the body in a stone coffin made with flat slabs and then covered the whole box over a huge pile of earth to make a little hill or burial mound. The fairy you know besides the second green on Bridge of Allen Golf Course is a good example. In 1868, it was opened by experts to see what was inside. They found some bones, a clay pot, and six flint arrowheads for, for over 2,000 years. Sorry. Bronze Age people lived peacefully in the Fourth Valley. But then they were swept away by the Celts. Fierce warriors with better iron weapons and who came from south to settle in the area. They belonged to many different tribes which sometimes attacked each other so that they built forts called, dun, called dunes to protect themselves. You can still see the remains of these defences, mostly ditches and walls on hilltops all around Stirling, such as Gowan Hill besides the Wallace Monument, and at Castle Law near Campus Barren, one local tribe was called, okay, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use the pronouncing they've used here, it's Mayadai, and their fort, fort was on the hill, we now call Demayat, the dune of Maya, Mayadai. I don't think I pronounced that right, but never mind. <laughs> In the year AD 80, the Romans invaded Scotland. They came to push back the wild Celtic tribes because they threatened southern Britain, so it was only soldiers who marched into the Stirling area. The, the defences of one of the forts can still be seen at Ardog near the village of Braco, a few miles from Stirling. You can also see the remains of forts and the Antonine Wall in the area around Falkirk, but there's something much to see in Stirling. The marks of possible Roman ditch defences can still be seen in the back of the Smith's Art Gallery and Museum, and partly under the King's Knot. The best way to view them is from the walls of Stirling Castle. Otherwise, only a few Roman coins, perhaps dropped by careless soldiers, have been discovered. So these are our ancestors, the first people to settle in the Stirling area, long before there was any town or castle. So it says here, long ago, Stirling and the Fourth Valley was all marshy land where hunters lived. So again, this is the River Forth, and this is the surrounding Stirling area here. I 
prizes appear at Sterling. The fact is that no one knows. It is possible that the first settlement was at St. Ninian's, where there have been a church for hundreds of years. On the other hand, the Castle Hill is also an obvious place for a village or a fort, on dry land, but surrounded by marshes and cliffs for protection. Some old papers, written about 1,200 years ago, mention a settlement in the area. There's too many words to mispronounce here. <laughs> They're called Herbs Le Doux, or Je Dis, perhaps Sterling's original name. Sorry for my French pronunciation there. For many years, rival tribes fought for control of the Sterling area. For much of the time, held the rock, but sometimes they were forced out by attacks from the enemies of the Angles. Then the Scots, a tribe which moved to Scotland from Ireland around the year AD 500, also began to attack into the area. Later the Danes also tried to attack into the area from England. It was quite a battleground. If you look at a picture of Stirling's old crest or coat of arms, you will see a wolf on it. This animal is always shown crouching on a rock. You can also see it on the badge of Stirling County Rugby Club. The wolf comes from a legend about old Stirling, when the area was ruled by the Angles. One night, more than a thousand years ago, enemy Danes were sneaking up to attack the town. The guard had fallen asleep and did not realise the danger, but he was woken by the howling of a wolf. He was just in time to call the others, and the Danes' attack was beaten, thanks to the wolf's warning. It is only a story, but it reminds us that there must have been some kind of village, and possibly a fort at Stirling long before the present houses or even the ancient castle was ever built. About the year AD 843, a very important battle was fought somewhere near Stirling. In this battle, the Scots, led by their king, Kenneth MacAlpin, most of what we now call Scotland, sorry, I'll say that again, led by Kenneth MacAlpin, defeated the and finally became the rulers of most of what we now call Scotland. No one knows exactly where the battle happened, but a big tall stone stands in a field near Stirling University's golf course. Some experts believe that it may mark where the battle was fought. From then on, Scots occupied the Castle Rock. It was such a strong place that Scottish kings probably lived there too, but this cannot be proved. Somewhere between the years AD 1107 and AD 1115, King Alexander I arranged to have a church built in the castle at Stirling. We know this because this letter still exists. Imagine a letter nearly 1,000 years old. It is the first definite evidence which proves that the castle was already there by that time. Unfortunately for the king, he didn't have long to use the new church because he died at Stirling Castle in AD 1124. If there was a royal castle there, there was almost certainly a community nearby. Any king living there would have needed merchants to help provide to help merchants, sorry, to provide his food supplies and craftsmen to repair his castle. They would have lived in houses near the castle. When King Alexander the first died, the next king was his younger brother David. He decided to make Sterling into an official royal burr. He gave the town a special paper and called it a charter, which listed the rights which the people were allowed to have. This probably happened in the year AD 1124, 
which means Stirling is one of the four oldest royal boroughs in Scotland. The other three are Edinburgh, Perth, and Inverlinn, which were also made in the year 1124. That's almost 900 years ago. King David's old charter does not exist anymore. It's probably said that the people of Stirling were allowed to have a weekly market, which was good because the folk would have to come from all around to spend their money in the town. Probably the town was also allowed to have its own town council, people chosen by the inhabitants themselves instead of a sheriff sent by the king. It is possible the king also said that the town could have a wall around for its protection. You would think that any town could do this, but this was not allowed unless the king gave special permission. What did Stirling actually look like so long ago? Firstly, it was very small. Only one or two streets where Broad Street is today. The houses were made of wood and clay and straw roofs. Because of this, the town accidentally burned down several times. We know this because experts found the charred remains of some of the houses when they dug when they dug in the ground near Broad Street. Close to the houses stood the town's first church, probably made of wood. But in the same place where the Church of the Holy Root stands today. So that's how Sterling started. Very different from today, isn't it? So here is a map of the old Sterling. There's a fortification there and the different waterways. This is the first picture of Sterling and it says, look how small Sterling used to be. It was tiny. to the 
dry rising ground where Air 3 is today. Because of the marshes, this road was built higher so the travellers would not get wet. This kind of road is known as a causeway, which is why the place where it ended is now called Causeway Head. Although Wallace had help from Andrew of Moray and his Highland fighters, the Scottish army was still quite small, perhaps about three or four thousand men. They were mostly poor folk, and their weapons were just spears and swords. The English had a much bigger army, perhaps as many as ten thousand well-armed foot soldiers and bowmen, and around three hundred armoured knights mounted on big, heavy battle horses. It did not look a very promising situation to the, for the Scots. Wallace and Maury had a plan, however. <coughs> the wooden bridge was very narrow, probably only wide enough to let two horsemen cross side by side. The Scots would let some of the English cross over. Then, as the enemy came along the narrow causeway, they would launch the attack, block off the bridge to stop more English getting across, and defeat those trapped on the cordon side. Did it work? Well, read on. On the morning of the 11th of September, in the year 1297, the English army began to file across the bridge. The smaller Scottish forces stood patiently on the slopes of the hills at Causeway Head, waiting for the signal to attack. The first English troops to cross were knights on their very heavy horses. They must have made a very impressive sight with their armour shining and banners flying, but crossing the narrow bridge took ages, and all the time the tide was coming in and the land was getting marshier. Local legend says that Wallace and Maury watched the English crossing from a viewpoint where the Wallace Monument is today. Certainly it's the best place from which to observe the flat land below. For several hours they watched the enemy knights cross the bridge and gather on the near side to come down the narrow causeway, causeway track two by two. And still the tide was rising. When about half of the English army was across the signal, sorry, I'll say it again. When about half of the English army was across, the signal was given to attack. Legend says that Wallace blew a horn so that everyone could hear. With cheers and shouts, the Scottish troops charged across the marshy lands towards the English. They didn't care if they got wet. Most didn't wear armour anyway, so it didn't bother them. What could the English knights do? They were on heavy horses. If they stepped off the narrow tracks, they would sink into the boggy land. They were trapped unless they could get back across the bridge to safety. Unfortunately for them, they had no chance. Some Scots reached the end of the bridge and blocked it with their long spears. This stopped the English reinforcements from getting to the battle, but also no one could escape either. Most of the English knights were killed, dragged from their horses by the Scots, or drowned in the marshland and tidal pools. When the English on the other side of the river saw the slaughter, they ran away. Their bowmen could not fire in in case they hit their own men, the spearmen were stuck on the wrong side of the river, unable to help. All they could do was save themselves. One of those, one of those was killed was the hated English Lord Hugh of Cressingham. Legend says that Wallace had his skin cut off in strips. He is said to have used some of it to wrap around his own sword handle. The Battle of Stirling Bridge was a great victory for the Scots. For the first time in history, foot soldiers had defeated mounted knights, even though experts had always 
said it was not possible. It made the Scots truly believe that they could beat the English and win back their freedom. You can learn more about Sir William Wallace if you visit the Wallace Monument. One of the star attractions there is Wallace's sword. But beware, it has been repaired and had bits replaced so often that little, if any, of the original sword remains. The wooden bridge was close to where the old stone one stands today, so it's very close. So that was up here where Wallace could look at the battle, and as you can see, it was so narrow. It was a, a tactically, it was an a excellent campaign for Wallace. This is chapter four, the Battle of Bannockburn. By the year 1314, Wallace was dead, captured and executed by the English. Robert the Bruce was King of Scots and the war against England was still going on. Most of Scotland had been recaptured so things were going quite well. In June 1314, however, an enormous English army, led personally by King Edward II, crossed the border and advanced into Scotland. Their mission, to rescue Stirling Castle, the only important fortress in Scotland still occupied by English troops. For months, the Scots had been besieging it, it had been saved. We don't know how many men this army had, probably about 20 to 30,000, mostly spearmen and bowmen, but with up to 5,000 mounted knights. Some reports say that with all the baggage weapons, the whole force stretched for over 20 miles along the dusty summer road from England some size. How was Bruce supposed to stop them? He seems to have had about 10,000 men, hardly enough to stop the much larger English army. He had done well so far because he had used hit and run tactics and had not fought the English in a proper battle, but this time he had no choice. On the afternoon of the 23rd of June, 1314, the first English knights came up the road from Larbert and about where the Granada Motorway service station is, had their first sight of the castle. There were only three or four miles to go. They must have felt very confident. Ahead lay the bannock burn. Then the road passed through a forest just beyond. Another track branched off to Stirling, but it crossed over marshy ground near the River Forth. As he expected, the knights on their heavy battle horses stayed on the dirty road and began to splash through the bannock burn towards the forest. This was just what Bruce wanted. He had dug deep holes called potty traps, potty straps, in the road, camouflaged over but with spikes in them. He had also scattered pyramid-shaped pointed spikes called is it called cult trap cult traps again the pronunciation sorry might be wrong all over the grass soon the knights horses began to stumble into the holes and began to panic some horses stood on the cult traps and ran about in terrible agony with spikes in their hooves just then, a young English knight called Henry de Bon recognised King Robert the Bruce and charged at him in a man-to-man -man combat. The story goes that Bruce was on a smaller horse, less impressive to look at, but more manoeuvrable. As the two men rode towards
towards each other. Dupont lowered his lance and urged his horse into a full gallop. Bruce had only a battle axe, but at the last moment he ducked, swerved his horse out of the way, and at the, as the big heavy horse thundered past, he rose in his stirrups and smashed his axe through the back of Dupont's helmet into his head. The Scots were jubilant, first blood to them. A famous statue of King Robert now stands in the area where this incident happened. The body's traps and de Bond's death caused most of the English army to hesitate, but Sir Robert de Clifford was more determined and led a group of 300 fully armed mounted knights on a charge towards the castle. Seeing the danger, Lord Randolph hurried with 500 spearmen to block the road. Normally, knights would easily have swept such puny opposition aside, but the Scots courageously stood firm and stopped the English from reaching the castle. No one really knows where this brave event happened, but nowadays the police headquarters building is at a place called Randolph Field. While nearby is Clifford Road, perhaps that's the area where it occurred. By now it was late afternoon, so the English decided to camp overnight and finish the journey next day. Taking the side track, they headed down towards the marshlands of the River Forth. That night they slept in a good place, protected from a surprise attack by the Bannock Burn on one side the Pellstream burn on the other, and the pools of the river forth behind them, exactly where Bruce wanted them to be. On the morning of the 24th of June, 1314, the English awoke to find the Scots already lined up for battle. In front of them, what had been a safe campsite was now a marshy battlefield, unsuitable for heavy English horses too narrow to use all of their foot soldiers and probably full of midges. Imagine them inside your army, inside your armour. First, the knights charged. Bruce had his men arranged in four huge circles called chiverons, each with over 1,000 men packed tightly into a group. When the knights attacked, they held out their long spears so that the horses could not get near them, so this idea failed. Next, the English tried a different tactic. They ordered their bowmen to fire into the ma into the mast. Sh I think it's sh sh Shiltrons. Again, sorry. To begin with, they hit many Scotsmen. Bruce ordered his cavalry to attack. On lighter horses, they galloped over the marshy ground more easily and forced the bowmen to retreat. Now the English spearmen were ordered to advance, but they could not spread out because of the panic burn, and most of them buried. Sorry, most of them were behind the lines of battle, uselessly shoving forward as they splashed through the pools and marshes of the fourth. For hours this struggle went on, but gradually it became clear that the English were slowly being driven backwards. Then King Edward was seen escaping from the battle, protected by a bodyguard of knights. You can imagine what the rest of the English army felt. Just then, even more Scots began to charge onto the battlefield. They were the Smaffle. Cooks and servants of the Scottish army who had been kept well away from fighting, but they wanted to be part of the victory too, as they charged down from Cox Hill, where Colton Hove is today. The English finally panicked and began to flee in all directions. Hundreds were killed as they tried to escape across the marshes, and so it ended the greatest victory in Scottish history. chapter. Yeah, let's
let's finish on the campus Kenneth Abbey that's a good one to finish on <coughs> so chapter 5 campus Kenneth Abbey have you ever been to look at campus Kenneth Abbey it stands on the other side of the fourth from Riverside and you can get there by crossing a footbridge to the village of Campus Kenneth. You can also go by road from Causeway Head, take the direction to Alloa, turn right where a brown road signposts to the Abbey. There used to be lots of abbeys in Scotland, but now there are only a few, though you can still see the ruins of some others. Campus Kenneth Abbey begun by order of King David the first about the year AD 1140. At first it was known as the Abbey of St Mary of Stirling. That's why there is a St Mary's Wind in Stirling. It used to be the road which led out of the town to the bridge and from there to the Abbey. Campus Kenneth was one of the most important abbeys in Scotland. Kings such as Robert the Bruce sometimes visited the place. Sometimes the Scottish Parliament met there in the year 1488. King James III was murdered nearby at Bannockburn. His body was brought to Campus Kenneth Abbey for burial. You can still see his grave at one side of the church. Did you know that a Scottish king lies buried in Stirling? In, 15, sorry, in 1559, however, by which time not many monks lived there anyway, the abbey was closed and most of the building was destroyed. The place is deserted now, but Christian monks used to live there. The monks belonged to the Augustinian order and they wore brown robes. There was a dormitory, dormitory where they all slept in one big room, a refectory where they ate their meals together, the chapter house where they met each morning to plan the day's activities, and several other buildings such as the kitchen and the infirmary. The most important building was of course the enormous church where the monks went to sing and pray. They worshipped there eight times every day, starting at two o'clock each morning. Imagine that. There's not much to see nowadays, apart from the tower in which the church bells used to hang. All the buildings are gone. After the abbey was closed, people came and took away stones to build other places in town. Why waste your money cutting new stone from the quarry when you could help yourself to a perfectly good stone block from the abandoned abbey building? Today you can still see the outlines of some of the abbey building, but the walls are only knee high. You have to read the explanatory notice boards to imagine what the abbey used to look like when the monks lived there. This is what the abbey does look like uh, today. Well, that was uh, quite a short chapter there, and I think it is a good place to end the video. So, I hope you really enjoyed that and found it informative and most importantly relaxing. If you would like to see more of the same, can you give me a little thumbs up? Please, that would be really kind. Thank you so much. Do subscribe if this is your first time to my channel and 